So in this presentation, as Wayne said, I'll be reviewing uh, some of MSA's activities, uh, particularly focusing on our field expeditions, uh, which have um, traveled from Arkarula to the Arctic via exotic locations like Utah and Ladakh. So for background, for those of you who haven't had much to do with this before, uh, MSA is an incorporated non-profit company with approved research organization status. Uh, so our goals consist of broad public outreach to instill the vision of pioneering Mars, support for more aggressive government funded Mars exploration programs around the world. And since MSA was funded, we've certainly seen that uh, to conduct our own Mars research. Uh, and that's the theme of uh, what I'll be talking about tonight, and to encourage Australian participation in planetary sciences, engineering, in education, industry and government. And certainly thanks to the efforts uh, of uh, groups such as NSSA and many, many other uh, people, uh, high and low, uh, we have seen a tremendous explosion in interest in Australian space activities and even amazingly official support uh, in the last few years. Uh, we are open as a membership to all those interested in Mars, uh, especially those who are interested in making a personal contribution. Um, these might be teachers, students, uh, communicators, scientists, engineers, tradespeople, spacious enthusiasts, and just general members of the wider public. And we have all of these groups represented in our membership. Now, I've used the word analog research. What do I mean by that? Well, there are four types of Mars analog activity. Uh, we have uh, field sciences, uh, field operations, human factors, education and training. And in particular, the focus of analog research is taking people and systems and performing Mars related tasks, Mars relevant tasks, gathering Mars relevant data in rem uh, remote locations or the physical locations that have some aspect that reflect what we believe we see on Mars. So in field science, we look at places on Earth that present one or more geological environmental features similar to those found on Mars, past or present, such as impact craters, sand dunes. Um, operations. Uh, analogs can play a particular and significant role in solving uh, problems with carrying out operations on the Mars surface. Uh, we can explore in analog environments, uh, be they uh, sand pits, such as the uh, Mars Yard, the CSIRO is making up at Pullen Vale, or in remote, remote locations such as Devon Island or Ladakh. We can test technologies, countermeasures, uh, procedures. We can do this cheaply, quickly, and certainly safer than we can do them on Mars. So we do analog operational studies on Earth because we can fail and not kill anyone on Earth unless we are really, really unlikely um, and find out which will work best and apply that to Mars. Same applies to human factors. We can study the impact of isolated, confined, hostile, and remote environments on things like team dynamics, um, individual psychology, uh, physical health, and so on. And lastly, in terms of education, we're taking people into the field, students, professionals, future astronauts, uh, into the field that in some respect reflect what we see on Mars. We can train them, we can educate them and inspire them uh, for the vision of the human presence on the red planet. And yes, we have been doing this for quite some time. Uh, our first expedition was in 2001, uh, the Jantamara expedition, which went to Central Australia and culminated at Arkarula. Uh, I won't go through all of these. You can see those there. And our most recent expedition is ongoing. Uh, Boomerang 2, MDRS Crew 292, is currently at the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. And Alex, uh, who is with us tonight, has just come back in this past week from Crew 291 in Utah. So we're very pleased to have him here. Uh, and we might even see the odd picture or two of him later on. And in addition to these expeditions where MSA uh, ha has either collectively or individually through our members played a leadership role, uh, we have been involved in many other uh, Mars analog expeditions in Australia, 
in India, in New Zealand, the United States, and in Namibia. So what are the sort of things we've done? One of the things we've explored at is how can we do field science or field engineering while wearing a spacesuit? What implications, what limitations does wearing a spacesuit impose uh, on um, uh, the human body, uh, the hu human individual? How well can they use tools? How well they can uh, make science observations? And in particular, we are focused on the art of making scientific observations while wearing a suit. So this is back in 2011. Uh, this is during the Space with Bion Pilbara trip uh, expedition. This is in the uh, Dawn of Life trail area uh, up near uh, between Nullagine and Marble Bar. And what we have here is a pressurized suit developed by the University of North Dakota, their NDX-1 suit, which is a fully pressurized gas pressure suit. Uh, it's actually he uh, heavier on Earth uh, than an equivalent suit would be on the Moon or, or Mars. Uh, it's pressurized to a higher pressure, in fact, than uh, such a suit would be. And so it uh, is much tougher to uh, do field work uh, in this suit than in the sort of suits we expect to use in the future. Uh, on top of that, by the way, it's not cooled. Uh, so um, you can imagine the issues of trying to wear this suit uh, in the Pilbara. We found that um, 20 minutes was about the limit uh, that um, our um, victims, I mean, experimental subjects, our volunteers, uh, were able to uh, tolerate working in the suit. And what, what they were doing uh, is uh, using, comparing the performance of engineers or non-geologists, non I should say, some of them were engineers and geologists in making observations about some of the uh, stromatolites, these microbial, these traces left by microbial colonies in these very ancient rocks in the Pilbara, about three and a half billion years old. Uh, and we have seen features on Mars that do resemble these. Uh, there's certainly sort of features on Mars that astronauts will be looking out for. And so we are comparing the performance of engineers uh, and, and non-geologists and geologists in making observations of these features while wearing a suit and comparing their performance while suited and unsuited. Uh, and the result was that, as you'd expect, uh, the engineers uh, and, and others uh, did not perform as well as the scientists, but both groups were able to carry out um, accurate observations while wearing, uh, wearing a suit and could do significant field science. Uh, and remember, none of these people had actually done any training uh, before they put the suit on, or had any practice in it. They were thrown in a cold, uh, even though they got very hot very quickly. Uh, and uh, these results have been published. A few years later, uh, in 2014 and 2016, uh, I took a different set of suits. These are more, uh, uh, these are actually analog suits uh, from uh, that MSA has built either for the Victorian Space Science Education Center on the left there, or for our own use on the right. Uh, they're essentially costumes, but they do impede the freedom of movement, freedom of observation. Uh, you are isolated from your environment by stiff gloves, by having to have a, a ventilation system to the helmet, uh, and uh, wearing heavy and clumsy boots. Uh, these were done at Arcarula, and we uh, had non-geologists and, and uh, geologists looking for stromatolites and trying to identify them in the field, and we assessed their accuracy over a time course. Uh, and we got similar results uh, in that both, both teams could perform, even though they came to a cold quite adequately, they could find the stromatolites and observe them. Field scientists obviously did better than the non-scientists. But surprisingly, the uh, wearing the suit didn't actually impede their ability to make the observations. And in fact, uh, they, they made more and more accurate observations while wearing the suit. Uh, than when they weren't. And this is something I'd like to investigate on a future trip. Anyway, these results have also been published in the Proceedings of the Australian Space Research Conference, um, and you can find those online. Another area that we have been working is in the, the area of field robotics. And our principal investigator here is Steve Hobbs, uh, who's based here in Canberra. Uh, he also was on uh, Mars... Uh, uh, Mars Desert Research Station Crew 291, 
Um, and here's a, an example of his handiwork. Uh, his two scratch built robots, a little functioning lander with a camera and a spectrometer on board and a little four wheel solar powered um, a rover, again, with a camera system and a spectrometer on board, talking to each other and to the control of our uh, wireless. And yes, they are functioning solar panels. So although for practical purposes, they run off batteries, which you recharge normally, um, you know, th this is the sort of technology that would function quite well on Mars. Uh, some of the expeditions that we've done, um, for example, in 2003, uh, we went to Rotorua in New Zealand. Uh, Steve took um, one of his robots then, an earlier version. And I think um, what we have illustrated here is um, the future of humanity, where the robot stays back and uh, where it's safe and the human goes forward and explores uh, to make sure it's actually safe to drive the robot uh, out there to a, a boiling stream. Uh, and uh, again, this this particular machine is carrying a, a scratch-built multispectral camera uh, and, uh, and a camera as well. And we worked at using um, a collaboration between someone operating a small UAV uh, and uh, the particular uh, rover here. Again, this, uh, all this work uh, has been published at ASRC and elsewhere. Uh, in 2014, we took a group to Arkarulan, a group of uh, mostly students uh, from, uh, uh, where do we have them from? U uh, UNSW, from um, Murdoch, from um, um, Monash University, uh, and people from MSA as well. Uh, to test, do comparative trials of different um, uh, uh, remotely operated and autonomous robots uh, in the field. And this is, as far as I know, the first uh, field comparative field trial uh, of robots in Australia by uh, predominantly students. And um, they, they were baselined against a, a series of tests developed to, by the U.S. Standards Association uh, to trial emergency response robots. And it included a, a torture chamber uh, that the uh, robots had to navigate. There were uh, load carrying or load pulling trials. There were endurance trials. And there were also trials in unconfined um, un uh, uh, terrain as well. Following on from Steve Hobbs' work in uh, robots, um, we came up with the, uh, or he developed a, a program that he called uh, Red Vision, which is to develop systems, uh, imaging systems, red edge spectrometers that could be flown on high altitude balloons under near Mars conditions, uh, and with the goal of eventually building technology that could be flown on CubeSats. Uh, this was funded by MSA, but also in part by Geoscience Australia. And um, the first flight of this uh, was uh, from South Australia um, with their uh, the Aries uh, one flight. Here's a view uh, from um, uh, 32 kilometers uh, across uh, across South Australia, across the Riverland. Uh, There's a more recent test flight uh, from West Wyalong with Robert Brand and his team. Uh, this is perhaps the best weather we. Um, we had this as a payload that consists of elements from Mars Society Australia and also from uh, a commercial payload for um, outreach purposes from, yes, you recognize him, the Bondi vet. Um, this is uh, quite an interesting flight. Uh, it, it reached um, 30 kilometers and the weather was so clear, the air was so clear, we were able to see the balloon uh, at, uh, at maximum altitude uh, if, yeah, if you knew exactly where to look. And here's some of the images we got. Uh, there's a West Wyalong landscape from 32 kilometers. And um, there are some multi-spectral uh, images that uh, Steve's camera collected. Um, and like early Landsat, um, uh, it, it focuses on vegetation health with healthy vegetation uh, coming up uh, in, uh, in this case in green and dry vegetation in red. 2016, 
We had a specific one of our specific education and outreach uh, conferences uh, and expeditions to Ladakh. Um, this was quite a large one. I think there was about 25 people there. We had people from NASA Ames, uh, JPL. Um, we had an uh, in international group of people from Australia, uh, not only the US, but Australia, um, Uzbekistan, and a very large contingent, as you can see, from India. Uh, and this is the start of our col collaboration uh, with, um, uh, with Amity University uh, in India. So for those of you who don't know Ladakh, Ladakh is a high-altitude cold desert on the extreme northwest frontier of India. Um, this particular location here at Hunda Lakes is about, um, uh, if, you, if you just keep going up the road, you, you hit Pakistan about 20 kilometers up the uh, up the track in what is currently the world, world's highest battlefield. The Indian and Pakistani armies sort of shell each other um, in a desultory fashion um, every year. Uh, and if you go sort of 10 kilometers the other way, you're in China. So um, there was a lot of paperwork to get into this, uh, into this area. Uh, but uh, once that was done, there was no real issues. And so what we, one of the things we were doing there, and this is my student, um, Savannah McGurk, uh, who's now down at the University of Sydney. Um, she was collecting data on the Barkanoid sand dunes, and I was collecting data on the um, interdune deposits. And um, Savannah was doing this for honours, and uh, she was able to publish several studies coming out of that. Uh, as has been my um, my study on interdune deposits. Uh, since then, we've been working with Amity University, who has created an astrobiology program for master's level students, and they've been back to Ladakh several times. Uh, they built their own rovers. Uh, they have selected a site for Mars analog research at the Sokar Salt Lake uh, at an altitude of four and a half thousand meters. Uh, so those springs there, they're hot springs. They're boiling. And because of the altitude, they're boiling at 82 degrees. Um, so a very alien environment, and it's a permafrost environment. Um, about 60 centimeters down, uh, there's ice, uh, permanently frozen ground. And um, uh, you know, it's one of the few areas uh, in the world where we actually have hot springs rising up to permafrost environments. So we would argue this is a, a very good analog for ancient Mars uh, in that you have uh, liquid water, uh, significant atmospheric pressure still below uh, Earth normal uh, um, at sea level. Uh, you have permafrost uh, and you know, we have in the right location, in the right environments, d uh, diverse microbial habitats. And this is also very high uh, ultraviolet flux here. Uh, the meters almost went off scale. Now, moving on to the analog station work. Uh, this is what most people think of. Hello, Puss. The cat's come in making, complaining. Um, he wants to uh, be let out. He's not going to be let out. All right, analog stations. This is what most people think of when we talk about analog research. And we've worked, we being MSA, at two of the three currently operational uh, stations in the world. Uh, the uh, Flashline Mars Arctic Research Station in the Canadian Arctic and the Mars Desert uh, Research Station uh, in Utah. Uh, in total, MSA personnel have spent uh, 820 crew days, uh, 40 people uh, in total. Uh, and, this is comp and this compares to uh, non-Mars Society Australians across all stations, FMARS, MDRS, and plus high seas in the Arctic of 102 crew days carried out by eight people. So we have uh, got the vast majority of Australian uh, experience and expertise in working in these environments under these conditions. So where are the two locations? Uh, on the left, we have MDRS uh, in Utah. And on the right, we have uh, Devon Island up in the Canadian Arctic. And uh, Utah is Utah. It's it's wild west country there. You know, you'd expect to see cowboys and Indians come cavorting over the over the skyline at any time. Uh, whereas uh, up in the Devon Island, uh, it's the largest uninhabited island in the world, two thirds the size of Tasmania. 
uh, 75 degrees north, a um, uh, very much a cold desert uh, landscape. Both stations uh, have been operating for many years. Uh, the one in the Arctic has been operating since 2000 and uh, the one in Utah since 2001. And they're both run by the U.S. Mars Society. So what do we see in Utah? Well, it's an environment dominated by flat lying uh, Jurassic to Cretaceous sediments. Um, that's 150 million to 200 million years old. Uh, dinosaur age. Uh, in fact, if you know where to look, you can find dinosaur bones uh, within the area captured by that image. Uh, and many of the classic dinosaurs we, we all learned about at school and our children and grandchildren, if we have them, are excited about like Allosaurus, Stegosaurus, Brachiosaurus uh, and the Brontosaurus all come from this particular rock unit, the Morrison Formation, uh, which is dominated by sandstones and shales with minor gypsum. Uh, the mineralogy is quite a good analog for Mars. Uh, this wasn't appreciated when the site was selected, which was chosen simply because it was barren and red. But as it turns out that the, the mineralogy, which is dominated by clays, um, particularly smectitic clays, swelling clays, and uh, gypsum and other sulfate evaporites, uh, is the sort of mineralogy you find in many places on Mars. The processes operating, or that did operate here, uh, river systems, uh, aeolian systems, um, and so on, uh, are again processes we now know occur on Mars. Climatically, it's a hot desert, but with cold uh, cold winters uh, down to uh, minus 15 is the coldest I've experienced there, and it can get a lot colder than that. Uh, astrobiologically, we find hyperliths. What are hyperliths? Well, if you go out into a desert, and you pick up a, a transparent, or translucent piece of quartz and turn it over, you'll often find um, green uh, algae, my microbes, cyanobacteria growing on the other surface in a microenvironment. We find endoliths. If you crack open a piece of sandstone in a desert environment, uh, you often find a greenish gray or greenish black layer uh, just a few millimeters below the surface, which again are cyanobacteria and other microbes living in a sheltered microenvironment. We also find halophytic organisms. Organisms are able to tolerate the high salinity associated with the salty groundwater. It's not a particularly isolated environment. So this is not a good place uh, to do isolation work. And so that's fine. There's other things we can research there. Uh, it originally started out with that tuna can there. Uh, the central hab back in 2001 and now since expanded uh, to having a science dome, uh, two observatories, one night observatory, one solar observatory, and a gar garage workshop, which wasn't installed when that uh, camera, uh, when that photograph was taken. It's uh, in part reliant on solar power um, and uh, uh, donated to us by um, SpaceX and, and unfortunately, sorry, by, by Tesla. Unfortunately, they were cheapskates and their battery system is just a standard uh, lead acid battery system. They didn't give us a Tesla battery. Make of that what you will. Devon Island, on the other hand, as I mentioned earlier, is a cold desert in the Arctic. It's dominated by limestones and um, uh, dollar stones, dolomitic limestones and gypsum. Uh, we don't expect to see much carbonate on Mars. In fact, we haven't seen any, uh, very little evidence for it. Uh, but its biggest ex attraction is that it's located inside the Horton impact crater, 22 kilometers across and formed 39 million years, or, uh, years ago. It's a well-preserved impact crater. We see melt rocks there. Uh, we see impact breaches, and the crater itself has been part of the infill by an old lake deposit, uh, which has all sorts of interesting fossils in it, uh, which aren't Mars analogs, but they find early seals and rhin uh, rhinoceros bones and other odd things as um, uh, they were living in a much warmer climate uh, in the uh, about 15 million years ago. Uh, as I said, it's a cold polar desert climate, cold summers, uh, about five to eight degrees, typically in the summer day, but very cold winters down to minus 40. Uh, permanent daylight in summer, of course, and permanent, da permanent darkness in winter. This permafrost, 50 centimeters down. So there are periglacial landscapes there landscapes formed through the action of freeze and thaw and frozen ground. And you can see some in the foreground of that image, uh, polygonal shapes formed by expansion and contraction of the ground. 
it's a very isolated and hostile environment. Um, if something happens, you uh, you need a medical evacuation. Weather permitting, you'd probably be a day or two before you could be evacuated. And if the weather was bad, you'd just have to wait until the weather improved. Um, other than the the uh, very host potentially hostile uh, weather, uh, there are also hazards of large white um, polar bears. And so every time you work outside there, you've always got to have someone uh, with you uh, carrying a shotgun on guard duty. So our time at these stations, um, I'll focus on some of the, on some of the more important ones. Um, several of us, and Lee Beatty, uh, known to many here, and myself, uh, was were part of the Mars 160 expedition in um, 2016 to uh, the Mars Desert Research Station, or the first half was there. We spent almost three months. Uh, and we carried out a range of tasks. Um, I was looking at the geological side of things with engineers studying at the assembly of various structures. This is a prefabricated Japanese survival dome uh, that we put together while wearing the mock-up spacesuits. Uh, we we're also able to access uh, from the UK Space Agency a, a sampling tool that they had designed for use both by robotic uh, missions uh, and also as a hand tool by by robots, uh, and uh, I'm trialing it out there. Uh, conclusion, it's a very good tool for robots, and it's a rather useless tool for astronauts, because it'd be a lot easier simply to get a hammer and crack that piece of rock off, rather than using the that tool to actually peck away and split the rock. Um, this is life in the HAB, and um, we're doing hydroponic research as well, uh, and, um, and people liked enjoying and what time off they had, relaxing in the sun in front of the front of the hydroponics. At the end of the crew, we actually slaughtered the hydroponics and had a great feast. Now coming on to the more recent activities there, uh, crew 291. Uh, not sure if that's Alex in any of them, but there's Steve Hobbs with uh, one of his robots and um, doing uh, field, field studies. Uh, we also had um, Claire Fletcher from the from UNSW, from the Australian Centre for Astrobiology. She got the Best Student Poster Award at last year's ASRC, and um, she is collecting data on this trip on um, uh, for her PhD at UNSW at the Australian Centre for Astrobiology in how to conserve, conserve the, the um, heritage value of significant sites on Mars. And currently, we have another group, uh, mostly Indians, with a couple of Australians led by Annalee Beatty. Uh, that's Annalee doing some work in the science dome there, the bottom right. Uh, seven people in all, um, a mixture of scientists and um, uh, engineers and, uh, and um, astrobiologists. Uh, you can see Claire there. And uh, here they are do, uh, doing work, planning EVAs uh, and uh, doing PCR analysis of samples of hyperliths, uh, endoliths and surface microbes. Uh, they've, take, uh, they've taken off rock surfaces uh, in their field area. Uh, the current news from them is that uh, they've had a number of delays because of bad weather. They've had snow. Um, the ground at MDRS uh, is dominated, as I mentioned earlier, by swelling clays. So with even a small amount of rain or snow melt, it becomes the worst, uh, the stickiest soil I have ever seen in uh, 40 years of field work. Uh, some of you might have, uh, be familiar with the black soils of Western New South Wales. Well, these are, these are worse than black soil when wetted. Second half of the 2016-2017 Mars 160 expedition was in the Arctic. Uh, the same crew, almost the same crew, doing similar work, but in a different station and a different location. And um, uh, the station was is almost identical. Um, so all of the crew interactions and the human factors will be very, very similar. The variations were due to working in a very different environment. So uh, again, we we're doing a lot of geological work, which I was in charge with. Uh, we had a, a organic 
uh, geochemist and microbiologist collecting samples. Uh, you can see uh, there are um, polar, polar bear guard taking photos of Anushri. Uh, see the shotgun slung over his shoulder. Um, and she's examining a large outcrop of impact rate uh, of impact breccia and is shot through by veins of ice. So again, a permafrost environment. Um, another one of our crew, Paul from the US, was doing his PhD on uh, polygons on the Earth and Mars. And there, while wearing the mock-up spacesuits, uh, he and Yusuke from uh, Japan are doing structure from motion uh, photographic surveys of some of the mega polygons developed on the sediments in the middle of the crater. And there's myself doing geological observations up on the rim. And we're also collecting um, lichens uh, for uh, the Canadian Museum. No, we don't expect to see uh, lichens on Mars, but the techniques that we use to identify habitats for uh, things like lichens and how we sample them and how we analyze them do provide us relevant information to constrain astrobiological um, studies on Mars. And some uh, scenes from inside the uh, inside the station, uh, gearing up for an EVA on there. Um, Nushri working on uh, some of the plants that uh, the relatively small number of higher plants that were growing in the area. Uh, non simulation work there with the incinerator. Being the Arctic, we had to burn all our waste, and I mean all our waste, and um, it was surprisingly effective and surprisingly non smelly. And to the other end of the process, yep, cooking cooking pancakes. Our French commander was uh, uh, very good at tossing pancakes. And down at the bottom right, life in the hab. Uh, one thing that always surprises people is the amount of time when you do a Mars analog mission, the amount of time you actually spend sitting around a computer, communicating with mission control, writing up your notes, uh, writing reports, and so on. And in fact, the EVAs, which everyone thinks you're up there to do, and we think we're up there to do, uh, is actually only a small part uh, of the overall program. We had a second crew there last year, um, led by uh, Andrew Wheeler, MSA member from Br uh, Brisbane, uh, another geologist, and he led a small crew of five people uh, to FMARS. <coughs> For a number of issues, which I won't go into, they had to curtail their, uh, uh, their trip, um, but they were able to complete two weeks there and do a lot of maintenance and also uh, some field science up there. One of the things they did was uh, the first sewing machine at the Mars Analog Research Station, repairing the spacesuits. Uh, they were able to sample uh, for microbial work, as you can see there, and collect gypsum for water extraction studies, which Andrew Wheeler is very, uh, very interested in. Moving on to education programs again. Uh, we had Ladakh earlier. This was another one we did last year, which was through Central Australia. Uh, I led a group of uh, people uh, on, a, on a tour of mostly impact craters. Uh, if you drive up to Alice Springs, you can visit the Henry clusters. And up top there, you have the largest of the Henry craters. There's about 12 of them uh, formed by... Um, uh, simultaneous fall of a, of a, about 14 or 12 to 14 impacting bodies, a uh, single body that probably broke up at low altitude, making these craters. Uh, you can visit the uh, Gosses Bluff impact structure. And most people have seen pictures of Gosses Bluff, this beautiful uh, ring formation of five kilometers across. Well, that isn't the crater. The, that's just the central uplift. The crater itself is almost 30 kilometers across and has been almost completely eroded away. There's no expression in the modern topography, and you just had the central uplift left. Uh, we also ventured, uh, visited other, um, other, another impact crater further north, uh, and uh, ended up through the Bioduck lava caves. Um, these are features we see on the moon, features on Mars, and the Bioduck is one of the few places where you're allowed to actually go into the Australian ones unescorted. Uh, and uh, we were there with Jen Blank from NASA Ames, who was part of the Braille's team studying uh, lava caves as Moon and Mars analogs. Uh, 
Uh, these are quite large. You can just see me in the bottom left there in the middle of the picture uh, with uh, Bharti Sharma, who's currently in Utah, uh, in the red jacket behind me. I mean, those cars, are, those um, rocks there, the size of large cars and small buses uh, formed by the collapse of the roof. Um, on the top right, we have these little, little nubbins uh, on the surface of the rocks and the cave floor. The first time I went there, I thought, oh, these are um, like little lava um, stalagmites that had been uh, formed by lava dripping from the ceiling when these caves were forming. But in fact, they're actually microbial uh, constructs, constructs by uh, bacteria, uh, and they're just everywhere. And uh, I was completely gobsmacked when um, Jen Blank's husband uh, brought out the UV light. And I had no idea this is what we're going to see, and he shone it uh, on the cave walls, and you see the whole cave walls are covered in fluorescing co uh, colonies of bacteria. So the, uh, this is uh, this is a quite remarkable underground uh, ecosystem uh, in a very sheltered environment um, that we do find on Mars. And if you find one that's warm enough to sustain liquid water, uh, it's a, a very much a place that we might look for uh, for Martian life. These, this is the first time anyone has done that. Uh, in Australia, uh, looked at these uh, um, lava caves as habitats and um, uh, much remains to be done. So closing remarks. What impact has all this work done? Remember, we're a volunteer organization. We run on the smell of an oily rag <clears throat> almost entirely on member subscriptions, and plus the occasional donation and the occasional grant. Uh, well, our Jantamara expedition uh, resulted in the selection of our ruler as our prime MSA uh, site, uh, and it led to all of the uh, subsequent expeditions we've done to our ruler, and also the NASA-funded research at Dalhousie Springs, which is one of the sites we investigated. Uh, the masking work we did uh, with simulated uh, suits um, uh, led to a contract uh, to supply simulation suits to VSEC, um, which they've uh, built on, uh, and also perhaps in a small way contributed to the um, uh, to the ongoing work now in compression, mechanical compression suits that human aerospace um, are doing um, through their director, uh, James Baldy and his team. Uh, and James is also one of our members and was on the original Jantamara expedition. Expedition two to MDRS produced multiple papers, some of them in a monograph, Expedition 2 to Arcarola, again, multiple papers and a monograph. Um, our space of bound uh, expeditions in conjunction with NASA led to education outreach across at least five countries. Um, the dark expedition uh, led to the establishment of the Amity Center of Excellence in Astrobiology, which is still going. Arcarola Mars Rover Challenge provided incentive for Australian and Indian institutions to send teams to the European Rover Challenge in, in um, uh, various locations in Europe, mostly in Poland, uh, and to the University Rover Challenge, MDRS, plus local student competitions. Uh, we have established collaborations with uh, NASA, ESA, Institute for Biomedical Problems in Moscow, Amity University, uh, BSIP, also in India, uh, Murdoch University, Australian Center of Astrobiology, Blue Marble Institute, and Planetary Science Institute in the US, uh, QGES, a company, uh, where Andrew Wheeler works and is a director of, in fact, in Brisbane and human aerospace, the space suits. I've uh, been able to contribute to policy documents, uh, resulting in analog research being included in the Australian Academy of Sciences decadal plans uh, and the CSIRO's uh, white papers on, on the future space science Australia. Publications uh, we've, we've supported four PhD students, three honors theses. Uh, uh, two mono, uh, monographs, uh, several books, which I haven't listed there, and over 70 peer-reviewed papers. So not bad for a volunteer organization, although I say it myself. So if you want to find out more of what we do, um, here's some contacts uh, that you can uh, follow up on. Contact my, uh, myself um, and uh, also our vice president and CSI website and our Facebook page. So questions? Uh, John, I think we put a few in the chat there. Um, 
just looking at the size of the um, the crews that were running on the uh, those missions, that somebody I think somebody put some comments there. Seven. Um, I thought it might have been six or eight. Looking at the numbers in there at the moment, although maybe because I counted somehow thought eight because of the size. So I think there's a minimum number you set by the look of it. Um, but although it seemed to be five, so what's the reasoning? But uh, all the mix basically involved in um, yeah. selling people for the uh, the missions. Yeah. So both the MDRS and FMARS are variations on the same design. Uh, they um, are based on Robert Zubrin's Mars Direct mission architecture, um, and their size for six people. If you look at historic Mars mission studies, the vast majority of them, or, or the biggest number of them, have consisted of uh, four crews of four to eight people. So six is a good average number. Um, there, there are reasons why um, uh, why larger numbers uh, are going to be un, unwieldy, uh, mostly from an engineering and logistic point of view. Um, and so for simulation meet, uh, missions to these stations, we're looking at um, minimum of four, but usually five, six or seven, and on a couple of occasions, eight. If you're doing non-simulation missions we have much larger numbers on our on our crews so i mean the largest one we had at md at fmars was sorry fmars mdrs was 12 uh, and of course summer ones to australia we've had um, over 20 people right yeah eva was saying that savannah has actually submitted a thesis according to what he's just... oh fantastic so times times marching on i we saw savannah a couple of years ago at the conference and then She's already put a PhD in, so. Mm. Well, it hasn't been quite so quick, but uh, yeah, it's three or four years. She's she's taken four years and it's, uh, yeah, an exciting time. Yeah, we Great, live. great person. But uh, she's already submitted. So I suppose it's in the review stage at the moment by maybe you before it goes out. Is that right? Or how's that? Uh, well, it's more in the stage of me still trying to find um, one examiner Ah, okay, reviewers. And it's it's on soil moisture. Well, I don't want to take over from John, but it's on soil moisture and soil carbon. And mm -hmm. um, that interplay is difficult. Yeah, it sounds like it might be a base, a, a extension to what she was doing with John anyway. Uh, with the current mission that's over in Utah, is, is, um, I know Annalise over there. Is, is Sid, Siddharth Pandey over there as well? Uh, no, he, he's been very busy with his uh, moving back to Australia. He finished his first stock with JPL, um, right. and he is now working for Fugro uh, in Perth, um, uh, working on their lunar mission plans. Um, but he was certainly involved in the planning and has a super uh, supervisory role, much like I do. Um, uh, um, I don't think his employer would have liked him disappearing off of there just a month or so after after he started to work. Yeah, I remember I would call him. Uh, he was actually helping you set up the connection with the university over there as well at the yeah. time originally with Ladakh because he was when he was over back in. Yes. So he's he's still very active in in that in the in building those relationships. Based on what um what was going on, I recall he said he would like to have gone to the ASRC last year, but it was just when he moved and he didn't have any time. Yeah. So it seems to be well, still one of his problems. Yep. Okay. So, oh yes, um, Scott was talking about Michael West. Now, my, last time I heard Michael West, he was working for Defence. So I don't really know where, where, whether he's still involved with MSA. Um, yeah. um, I knew that's where Michael went to later yeah. on. He basically, uh, I think, he decided that he would focus on Defence rather than on Mars. Um, I think it was a great loss for us. Uh, but he, the last time I spoke to him, he seems very happy. Happy they're doing there. Um, whatever he's doing there is all very hush hush. Still down in Canberra though, isn't he? That was very. I believe nice. so. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we've got one of our directors, Peter Johnson. He's working for Downer, so he can't talk yep. about what he's doing either. That's right. Yeah. The the type of stuff he's in one of we're working with other defence contractors, so uh, the same type of problems about security and stuff like that. So. Yeah, okay, so just looking at uh, what else we've got. Somebody asked a question about... Oh, Anne said she wanted to know whether was, she could send messages to people over there. Um, yes. Um, Alex, uh, do you have any update on uh, messaging uh, 
<coughs> procedures for crew? We have a uh, we had a soft comms window. I say soft because we had Wi-Fi. Uh, we could access it if we needed to, but for the most part, we kept our communications to a seven to nine pm window local time. So I think that equated to uh, yeah. I know it was um, around midday Perth time, probably early afternoon Canberra time. Mm. So I think they're still doing that with yeah. uh, the current rotation. But yeah, if, if there is an emergency or anything like that, of course they can they can contact outside those hours. Yeah. Emails yeah. probably. Um, probably I've uh, I've been able to contact uh, Annalee uh, by both SMS and email. Um, uh, and if you if you uh, you know, were thinking of contacting her. Yeah, well, and and I know Claire as well. Yes. Okay, well, you could uh, if you got their email, I'll just 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 drop, drop them because yeah, Molly just sent sent me a message to say she can't attend another meeting. I've got to organise in a couple of days, and that's because of the time zone anyway. But she's probably too tied up. So, I mean, you could obviously drop them an email if you know how to contact them, and we'll probably get back to you when they can. Yep. So just so do you that. have those emails? Anna? I I certainly have Anna Lee, so I could get Anna. I can um. Email yeah. Anna Lee and ask her if yeah. I, she can get me in touch with Claire yeah. as well. Yeah, they, they have Starlink now, so some of the uh, uh, restrictions on the, how much you can send uh, have been lifted. So I've been emailing papers that have been requesting and so on. Mm, I think uh, are they, uh, did they do like any educational stuff? Like, do they like Zoom to a class or anything like that? Yes. yes. Yep. Okay. Um, I believe they had one uh, this afternoon. I wasn't able to attend because I was um, uh, I was out driving a school bus. Um, Alex, you had a yeah. had a um, some sort of media event when you were there. Yeah, so our commander Andrew Andrew Wheeler he had a a podcast appearance at one point. Um, the rest of the crew we kind of made a, a cameo role, but he he sort of sat in his uh, his dorm for an hour and and talked to I think it was igniting the space down under. So that that went up during our rotation. That will be up now as well. Yeah, but not nothing sort of more broadly um, in terms of educational outreach. So uh, they'll be finishing up this weekend. So if you want to um, do something uh, with Iran, you better contact us soon. Okay. Yeah. Right. There's also a question about UV lights. I see. Yes. Yes. Um... I think he's talking about those on the rovers, so that would be the ones that uh, Steve has done. Um, Steve hasn't put UV lights on his his right. rovers. Um, I, Curiosity has a UV lamp, uh, which I know they've used a couple of times, uh, but I don't think they've turned up anything particularly interesting. There's been no uh, no uh, fluorescence uh, observed. Uh, but I haven't seen any pipe, uh, papers on it either. It's just been sort of uh, the odd odd photo, uh, you know, popping up in the news feed. Right. Scott's got a question on the key messages and conclusions from the 70 re peer-reviewed papers. My my guess, though, Scott, is that the papers are very diverse, but I'll see what John says. <laughs> yeah. Um, so they, they cover geology, mm. astrobiology, um uh, astrobiology again including things like uh, microbes uh, extremophiles um lichens there's a, a lichen paper coming out at the moment i've just uh, we've just sent off the final proof on the, from the arctic uh we've looked at uh, sedimentary geology landscapes uh, regolith mapping uh there have been papers on engineering studies suit studies um rovers uh, had uh, different rover configurations and operational procedures um uh, and uh what else uh, site selection um i don't actually i don't actually have them all pulled together here because they're so diverse and all over the place it's something i should do um and of course there's all the papers that have been done on uh by other people in the us as well and, and europe uh using these facilities and of course they're all the robot trial papers that, we, that were published as well yeah, we've had quite a lot different types of papers at ASRC level. There's been stuff on spacesuits. There would have been stuff on rovers. Mm. Uh, Steve had stuff on instruments he's tried to do. I mean, there's been, they've been all over the place in terms of uh, diversity in, in types yes. of uh, topics covered. So they aren't all geology. Some of them are the ones that you've been putting in. Mm. So there are, 
it's um, it's pretty much covers everything that had John has mentioned in the talk in terms of diversity yeah. of what they're going to be doing there. Uh, Lou, you had a question. Uh, yes, um, a, a few actually, but uh, starting with spacesuits, um, I noticed this, the sewing machine, the sewing spacesuits. Now, mm. the sewing machine seams are not exactly airtight, as I understand. No. How do you seal that? Okay, now, um, they are analog suits, so they're, they're not pressurized. Uh, they're made out of heavy canvas, um, and they, they are... Primarily to get, other than to just give the visual, imp you know, to look good in photos, uh, they also serve to. I see. So I'm looking for the restrictions, basically. So it's not really. They, they, they are stiffened, so they constrict movement. Um, they isolate you from the environment, so you're interfacing with, you know, through a, a helmet, which has to be ventilated. If you want to communicate, you've got to use a radio. Um, yeah, so you can't just sort of casually chat to people you've got to go through the radio protocols um they are you're wearing heavy boots vision is restricted as well um you can't scratch your nose when it itches um and they are even though they as i said they are costumes they're surprisingly um effective in getting you into the mindset that you're actually doing an eva to the points for example uh, maybe, uh, some of the first work I did we were using working with a rover and we had people not wearing the suits halfway through our simulation coming up and and filming documenting what you're doing it was actually quite a shock you know why aren't they dead why are they, you know they're not wearing suits um <laughs> so um the trials that, that I did at Arcarula were were designed to see how well uh, how much the um, the suit impacted, and that's a work in progress. Surprisingly, it had little um, or even a positive impact on people's ability to do science. So I want to find out why. I've been talking with uh, Cheryl Bishop, uh, who's just recently retired from the University of Houston Medical School, uh, done a lot of space related psychology as to why that might be. One possibility is when people are actually wearing a suit, they actually get hyper alert and hyper focused, and uh, and start working better. Of mm -hmm. course, with current spacesuits, the the gas pressure ones, as I've mentioned in previous talks, are just so unbelievably mm -hmm. difficult to work in that you do expect some degradation of performance. So this is what the what the uh, University of North Dakota suits uh, did show, because that was a gas that was actually a gas pressure suit with a rubberized uh, canvas bladder uh, and an outer layer um, on top of that. Uh, plus plus uh, proper bellows joints and um, and reinforcing to stop it ballooning out when pressurized. Uh, and also MSA, are there other people similar organizations to MSA? Are they collaborators, competitive competition? Yeah, we are. Um, there's a number of Mars societies around the world. Uh, the US one is the biggest. Um, uh, some of them are. So student chapters at universities, which come and go depending on you know, the enthusiasm of the students. Of course, you know, one of the things about students is you have uh, very enthusiastic students and they graduate and go somewhere else and their society, sort of, you know, and this is true of all student societies, may die away. But there have been, um, at the University Rover Challenges, for example, both in, in Europe and at MDRS, they've had, they've had sometimes 40 or 50 universities from all over the world represented um so you know here's a little little town of um perhaps 200 people and you know every year um two or three hundred students all over the world descend on it to do robot trials it's a big thing also um i was surprised when you you didn't get much response from tesla as regards the battery the lead acid that you got um elon musk was so he's so into mars isn't he the, yeah the, yeah but it doesn't touch his hip pocket for other people <laughs> he's, he's talking I mean, it's terraforming you know isn't it? yeah yeah it didn't get him enough publicity for you guys then, uh in fact the musk foundation did fund one of the observatories and helped build the original station at utah so they, they had I, I i shouldn't be too uh uh, too grumpy that they, they have actually been quite generous um but um uh yeah yeah 
So it's all the early days, of course, now, but I mean, the thought of terraforming Mars too would be, mm. is that ever been thought of? Or, I mean, of course, thought of, but you know, discussed it yeah. at this stage, or <laughs> what sort of thoughts on that? Mm. It's it's beyond beyond the scope of, of what we can we can do. Um, I, I mean that that's in the realm of say uh, of global planetary scale environmental modeling. Yeah. Of of the effects of, of global changes in albedo and volatiles, uh, you know, heat and heat and light flux and so on. Um, I think one of one of our compendiums we had a. Uh, we had a paper by Charles Coquel that touched on, on uh, some theoretical aspects of terraforming, uh, but that's as far as we've gone. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Julian's put a couple of questions in there about the studies relating to different surveys. I'm not sure whether they really would be related. Um, did you see them? You see it in the chat, John? Um, the, the, there's a question there about um, uh, geological studies, and local surveys. Um, well, as I mentioned, uh, Geoscience Australia did uh, fund our, uh, some of our balloon work, uh, which has been very useful. Um, people from the USGS have been on some of the expeditions, They're not our expeditions, but there are other expeditions at Utah uh, and so on. Um, the uh, lichen work we were doing when we were in the uh, in in the Arctic was um, uh, through the um, the Canadian Museum or M Museum of Canada or whatever they call call themselves they they provided the support there uh, geophysics um, different crews have taken uh, different instruments along so um, one of the uh, I wasn't on it but one of the expeditions to um, the dark uh, some of the Indian students did, did some ground penetrating radar work. With some success. Um, one of the trips I did to MDRS, we had um, uh, JPL had built a ground penetrating radar, um, which we ran surveys uh, over channels, paleo channels uh, in the MDRS region. Seismic refraction and seismic reflection work have been done at both FMARS uh, and uh, the Mars Desert Research Station as well. Um, so there's certainly been. Uh, it's whatever the sort of work that we've done is whatever people want to take along. So it's a bare bones facility. It provides the accommodation, the bench space, the power systems and so on, and a field area. And then people bring their equipment and slot it in to do whatever it is they're interested in. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Okay. So any, qu any further questions? So just looking into the future, um, obviously the uh, Crew 292 is still happening. Uh, we are looking at running the Central Australian trip uh, again uh, in the middle of this year. Um, numbers are limited simply from uh, trying to book group accommodation. Uh, it's tricky in the middle of the year, even outside school holiday time. Um, so looking at taking you know, perhaps um, between 10 and 14 people. Uh, we keep costs down to a minimum by people bringing their own vehicles, so self-insured, um, you know, you you come at your own risk. Um, and, you know, essentially a, you know, a group of friends uh, interested in looking at planetary analogs. Uh, we're visiting the same sites as we did in the last trip, the impact craters, the lava caves, uh, also the salt lakes and sand dunes, which I didn't show pictures of, but um, Lake Tyrrell, which is a radioactive um, acid salt lake, uh, and also Pink Lake, which is some of the most amazing biofilms I've seen in any lake anywhere. Uh, both of these are in Victoria. Right, so that's probably planned then for July, August this year then? Both on yes, July. yes. Last week of July, first week of August. Okay, fine. Yeah, well, we've we've had to move the other conference in Perth for forward about three weeks, so hopefully there'll be no problems. With no, no, no. Um, it, it'll, it'll finish uh, a month before, or, or almost uh, almost exactly four weeks before the Perth conference starts. Yeah, it gets complicated sometimes with that, that window. Of, there's a lot of things happening sometime with other yeah. conferences, so uh, we had to move that one forward. So that will be um, 